who is here with us this evening at the Willette Church of Christ. And if you're joining us by live stream, we especially appreciate your viewing. I'm going to start this evening by singing the first stanza of number 688. For 688. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. We will rest in the fair and happy land by and by just across on the evergreen shore. Sing the song of Moses and the Lamb by and by, and dwell with Jesus evermore. Will you bow with me, please? Father in heaven, we're extremely grateful for this great privilege of being able to bow in thy presence communicating unto Thee through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're thankful for the position that He is serving us in, not only as Savior, but the one who takes our petitions unto Thee. We're thankful that things are as well with each of us as they are, and we ask Thee to continue to be patient with us and forgive us of our sins, weaknesses, and shortcomings that oftentimes lead to sin. We pray that we can learn from our mistakes so that we can be better people. Thankful for all those who have gathered here and those who may be watching or viewing in some other way or listening. We ask Thee to continue to bless those who are dealing with health issues, especially among our brethren. We pray for those who are mourning the passing of loved ones and friends. We pray that as we have opportunity, we can lend assistance wherever we possibly can. Thankful to have faithful brothers and sisters that we can rely upon and turn to. We're thankful for those who have prepared lessons for the students at this place tonight. We pray that the students, we will be attentive to what is said and and that the teachers will be able to communicate to us in ways that are helpful to us we can understand. We pray for the situation that obtains in our country at this time. We pray for peaceful resolution to conflicts and problems and situations that truth and right may prevail. We pray for those who are trying to keep us safe and trying to arrive at peaceful solutions to problems. We pray for those who are in places of authority over us, and we pray for those who are at any place in the world trying to defend freedom and promote things that are good and right. We pray for those situations where the leaders do not have the best interests of the citizens in mind. And we pray that they might turn from that so that they will do what is best. That we can, to the extent possible, live peaceably with all people. Please continue to be with us as we try to serve Thee and Use the talents and abilities that we have to the greatest extent possible. We ask Thee to continue to watch over us and care for us, and that we might be able to be close together and always close to Thee. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen.
you'll turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 9. Okay, now, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, what we were looking at is a section of Scripture dealing with the concept of Christian liberty. This means that the Bible's only so big. There are a million different situations that come up in your life where you can make a decision, and there is no right or wrong with respect to the action itself. A lot of people need to understand that Christianity is not nearly as complicated as they try to make it out to be. Paul pointed out at one thing, all things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. There is no thing that God made. Think about it. God made things, right? Well, there is no thing that's bad. It's just in how you use it. You can use something in a bad way, but the thing itself is not bad. Otherwise, God wouldn't have made it. That's why people, uh, I don't know everything about the origin of Satan, but I do know that whether you describe him as a fallen angel or some being that at some point initiated the rebellion of lying and murder and that kind of a thing, what, and basically rejection of dominion, whatever sins you attribute to Satan, he was not made doing those things, right? Because God doesn't make bad things. It's what you're doing with the things. So when people make decisions about different matters, a lot of times it's not a question of, oh, I see that, that is a bad thing, I'm going to you know, avoid that. It's like, well, it's not that that's bad in and of itself, it's how I would use this or, or to, in what way I would use this or do this. And you want to keep in mind, is it the loving thing to do? And the second thing is, is, is it something where I can keep a good, what was that word started with a C, class? Conscience, right. Can I keep a good conscience? And would my neighbor be able to have good conscience while seeing me do this kind of a thing? Or would I do something that would destroy him for whom Christ died? I don't want to do that. So you ask yourself, as a Christian, I'm not tied by any superstitions. I'm free. There are very few things the Lord wants from me. I'm to be grateful unto him, which is expressed through my worship, right? God wants me to be good. Folks, that's, that's it. That's, that's pretty much got it. So the world has all these systems and things that they say you need to be worried about or do this or do that or you're, they're, that they're uh, you know, worried about as far as the, uh, doing things that might uh, be bad luck for you and all that. Christians don't worry about any of that stuff. But I don't want to use my liberty as a cloak for malicious actions or things that will pull somebody else down. So is it loving? Is it in accordance with good conscience? In chapter 9, we have not yet answered the questions, and we're going to look at a few things connected with that this evening, but first we need to study on the text a little bit. Paul had already said in chapter 8, the question of meats is just like that. I can eat meat or I cannot eat meat. It's not a matter of right and wrong. But is it loving for me to eat meat in this situation is it a matter of good conscience? Would I be doing something that is going against my own sense of right and wrong or against another person's sense of right and wrong? If that's the case, then I should be careful about what I do because he says, if meat makes my brother to offend, this is the last verse of chapter 8, I will eat no flesh while the world stands, lest I make my brother to offend. I, I'm, not, I'm not about that. Not in matters of option. Now, we pointed out before Jesus, when it was a matter of doing what's right and saying the truth, then he was just like, it'll fall where it will. I mean, if you don't like it, then I can't help that. I can't help being who I am, and the truth is what it is. The gospel is what it is. But there are some things that are not gospel, like the eating of meat. It's just something you can choose to do or not choose to do. So the next one is how this applies to the Apostle Paul. 
it's not that Paul wants to deal with the subject of paying the preacher per se. That doesn't really, that's not what 1 Corinthians is about. It's not that the Apostle Paul is concerned per se about the immediate controversy of is he a full-blown apostle, although that does have a bigger standing here in the context than the idea of paying the preacher. The, this is an issue that will not go away with the Corinthians. I don't know why. I don't know that anybody can identify the exact reason why the Corinthians had an issue with Paul when it comes to this, but Paul obviously saw something in the church there, and he realized that it's going to be better for me if I do not get paid from you all for what I'm doing. Now, Paul accepted uh, receiving gifts and things from other churches, didn't he? The Philippian church is the most probably notable of all those that gave to Paul. But when it comes here to uh, the Corinthians, Paul's like, no, you, I didn't take a dime from you all. And he is explaining himself in chapter 9 because he doesn't want them, number one, to think that it's that paying the, the preacher is just that, a matter of uh, option with us. He said, no, it's not really an option with you all. It's an option with me personally, whether I take it or not. Um, the other thing is he wants them to understand that does not reflect on my apostleship. I have a right to do this. And remember, we're talking about Christian rights and liberty based on your knowledge. And it, was this the best thing to do? Paul is gonna, Paul's going to say, yes, this was the best thing for me to do it was the most loving thing for me to do, and you all need to just kind of go with this idea, okay? It was the best thing, the most loving thing in the situation, so uh, we're, we're not, there should be no problem here. That's what chapter 9 is about. So let's look into chapter 9 and read a little bit. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord, or not you not my work in the Lord? So we go on down, and we've talked about some of this somewhat. The apostle himself here is obviously identifying himself as having the qualifications, as we mentioned before, of being one. He had seen the risen Lord. He is someone that they could personally say had brought them the gospel truth, and therefore their identity as Christians, since they were a product of what Paul had preached, they themselves are a proof that Paul is indeed an apostle of the Lord. He was able to produce Christianity in us when he brought us the truth and demonstrated that truth in front of us. If I were not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of my apostleship you are in the Lord. My answer to them that examine me is this. Do we not have power to eat and to drink? Now he goes on a little further where we'd already studied on some of this about Cephas and all that kind of thing. Uh, he, he has a wife. You know, whether you have a wife or not, that's also a matter of option. Um, and then he goes on to say uh, something I wanted to touch back on. Do I say these things as a man, he says in verse 8, or do I not does not the law say the same thing? Well, what did the law say? The law said, as is quoted in verse 9, it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treads out the corn. Does God take care for oxen? Now, this is a rhetorical question. In other words, God is not going to take precious time in Scripture to explain about your practical benefit of, of dealing with your cattle. That's not the main gist of Scripture, is it? Now, that doesn't mean God wants you to abuse animals, but that's not what in the context he was talking about. He, he doesn't worry so much about that. When he says, you don't muzzle the mouth of the ox that treads out the corn, the bigger application, the more meaningful application is, is that when somebody does something, that they must be recompensed. That that's not a, a, an optional thing on the side of the person that received the benefit, received the service. You need to recompense for that. So does God take care for oxen? That's not The point of him saying that in the Old Testament was not oxen. Does he say it not altogether for our sakes? Once again, a rhetorical question. The answer is yes, it's for our sake. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written. He that plows should plow in hope. He that threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. So if I have preached to you, Paul says, then certainly it was right for me to be able to receive payment, but he didn't press it with them and he didn't want it. So the next section here in the rest of the chapter explains it. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we reap your carnal things? By carnal, he does not mean things bad, ladies and gentlemen. He means things fleshly, fleshly. Uh, things of a physical nature. When Jesus was talking one time in the 
uh, par parable did he not say that a person need to understand how to use the mammon of unrighteousness? Okay? He's talking about the things of the world, fleshly things. He's not saying do bad deeds or sneak around like people of the world. That's not what he's teaching. He's talking about you've got to be wise in dealing with matters of this life, fleshly matters. So he says, we sowed unto you spiritual things. We preached the gospel. So it's certainly not uh, any great thing if we should reap your carnal things. In other words, money. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? So other people, others that were called apostles, perhaps in the most immediate sense, people like Cephas and Barnabas, would they not be people that you would likewise think of as, as uh, able to receive? And yet I didn't receive any money from you, Paul is pointing out. Nevertheless, we have not used this power. I, I didn't take any money. But suffer all things lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Now a person wonders in what way would it hinder the gospel of Christ. I'll readily admit to you, Paul does not really spell it out. I don't know why it would have been a problem with them. But Paul thought it would have been a problem. And he does give a personal reason for not taking the money here in a moment. Okay? Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? This goes way back to an understanding of how God had set up the Old Testament religious system. Verse 13, in the old days when God set up the tribe of Levi, everybody got their place to live, didn't they? I guess this is on my mind fresh because we're doing that geography class on Sunday morning. But on the right side of Jordan you had what tribes? Reuben, Gad, very good, and Man right, Manasseh, there you go. The half tribe of them, you're right. And the other half is on the, the left side. Then all the other tribes on the left side, right? But were there not Levites living among those on the right side? Yeah. Were there not Levites living among those on the left side? Where was the land given to Levites? You can look in your little Bible map. You're not going to see a Levi, uh, a Levi land, are you? Not at all. The Levites were given, by and large, as suburban and city dwellers. Suburban and city dwellers. That way they could attend to the people in priestly function and into the matters, especially around Jerusalem or uh, earlier Shiloh, wherever it is you know that the priestly functions needed to be done. And... The, they could attend to um, the things that, of God in that regard. And God said, when you have your sacrifices, the free will offerings, the votive offerings, the uh, sin offerings, the you know just all kinds of offerings that they had there, trespass offerings and so forth, when you bring them, the blood on some of them is poured out, isn't it? But the meat, where does the meat go? Yeah, back to the Levites. There you go. They don't have land, do they? It goes back to the Levites. The Levites farmed land or made garden spots up to so many feet out from a city, uh, a city uh, boundary. Uh, back then, most cities, if they were of any size, were walled, of course, for protection and such. And so you go out so many feet in a, in a circle from there. You can read the Old Testament on this. And they lived of what they could do with that land. So they made their own home gardens. And then the people brought the meat to them from the sacrifices and grain offerings and drink offerings and so forth. And I'm not sure if they got any of the drink offerings. can't remember right now. But the fact is, is that they live of that. That's what he's pointing out. They live off of that. And so he says the Old Testament backs me up in this. But he says you don't have to live of it in the New Testament way. So Paul, instead of living of it like the priests did in the Old Testament, what did he do among the Corinthians? Not everybody, but the Corinthians. He was a what kind of person? Tent maker. Very good. Yeah. So he, he had a secular job so that he didn't need to partake of their, their carnal, their physical things. Even so has the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But I have used none of these things, he says, verse 15. Neither have I written these things that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory in void. Now here we get into a section where he is explaining personally, for Paul personally, why was he not taking uh, the money? Well, he's going to use this for his own personal betterment before God. Okay? 
I'm not saying he didn't have reasons for the Corinthians not to be giving him money. I'm saying that Paul says, I've got a personal investment in this well as well. Here's Paul's personal way of thinking about it. Verse 16. Though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Verse 16 reminds me so very, very much of the statement made by Jeremiah, as you read in the middle of that book. And Jeremiah was saying, that I decided at one point that I would not speak his word, but it burned within me, he said, didn't it? Now, you know that it wasn't a literal fire there, was it? But Jeremiah was saying, what am I? I'm a preacher. I've got to do this. This, this has to be done. And I will say it, even if I had decided, well, I'm tired of this and i got to quit for a while. He said, no, 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 the word burned within me. I had to speak. And Paul is saying, this is what I am down in my very bones. I have to do this. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got, I think it's probably from Charles Lemons and some other gospel preachers as well, in starting out is that they told me, and I believe it applies to many professions. You get much further in your profession if this applies to you. They told me, they said, look, if you can do anything else other than preach, do it. And they didn't mean by that that preaching is only for people that can't do anything. <laughs> That's not what they meant. What they meant was is that you get a job doing something else and you're not satisfied. You get a job doing anything that you're doing in life, whatever it is, and you, you can't find any satisfaction in that. You've got to preach whatever it else it is you're doing. Something else may pay the bills better or it may be more stable or what it doesn't matter. You've got to preach the gospel, whatever it is, it is you're doing. So they said in that case, yeah, you can preach. So uh, I believe that is a good guide for helping a lot of people in what they do in life. That way they're going to be able to pour everything into it. He says, I've got to preach the gospel. Now, he explains himself further in verses 17 through 19. If I do this willingly, and ladies and gentlemen, the reason I'm focusing so much in this middle verses here is because this is the most um, hard to understand section and I'm giving my take on it. If I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dis dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Paul evidently thought that the gospel would be furthered among them for him to take the stance of not receiving monies. I'm not charging you at all. And secondly, Paul said... I've got to preach the gospel, and I'm a servant. Now, Jesus taught that when a servant does everything they're told to do, they're supposed to say, I'm an unprofitable servant. I've just done what I'm supposed to do, right? He says, I I'm going to preach the gospel regardless. So Paul said, this, this is not an optional thing with me. I'm the gospel, the gospel preacher to the Gentiles, the apostle of the Gentiles. I'm going to preach it. The Lord, I owe the Lord everything. He saved Paul when Paul was persecuting God's people. Paul was headed, ladies and gentlemen, to, to hell with his back broke. It was going to be bad for him, wasn't it? Real bad. And Jesus pulled him back from the brink. Paul is going to give his life no telling how many times for the sake of the Lord, isn't he? He's going to preach the gospel. But he says, guess what is optional with me? I can take money from you or not. Now, if I willingly use my right not to take money from you, I get rewarded. You see what he's doing? He's heightening his own sense of reward. He's heightening his own glory here. How can he be even more spiritual among them? But he's going to preach it to them regardless. But you know what? Maybe some Jewish background brethren can send him some money or something. I'm not going to take it from these Corinthians. I'm not sure what his reasoning entirely is. Maybe it's because of the multicultural aspects of the Greek city. But for whatever reason, but he took some, from some other Grecian types, so I don't know. The fact of the matter is, though, is that he says, I am going to preach it to you, but it's in my power. I do have a right from God to say whether I'm going to give, be given money for it or not. And among you, he says, I'm not charging you. So... Uh, that way, he's going to gain more people and he's going to get glory before God because he's going to choose the more spiritual path for him among them. 
uh, whatever is more spiritual to gain more souls among them is what he's all about. And he says, in your case, that means I didn't charge you, and that doesn't mean I don't have the right. It doesn't mean I'm not an apostle. It just means I'm not charging you money. So let's go on from that is kind of what he's saying. <laughs> That's my take on down through verse 19 anyway. Unto the Jews I became as a Jew. Now these are practical matters here for the gaining of any soul that I might gain Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. Paul didn't have a problem with shaving his head sometime, right? If he was around a bunch of Jews and uh, culturally there was something going on and he thought that was the thing to do. Paul didn't have a problem wearing a particular kind of Jewish robe if they was around Jews and that's the kind of thing that they wore. But on the other hand, Paul's not going to fuss at those Gentiles when uh, it comes time for New Year's and everybody is, uh, I don't even know what they called New Year's back then or when it was, but uh, when everybody's happy and they, uh, they cook one of those big pigs with the apple in its mouth, you know, and laid it out there in front of everybody. And uh, you know a Jew's not touching that, right? But... Paul knows better now, doesn't he? He's not going to fuss at those Gentiles. They, they want to do that? Sure. Let's, uh, let's eat, drink, and be merry. That kind of thing, you know. So the idea is, is that he is going to be what he needs to be around people to win them to Christ. To them that are without law as without law. That's the way I behave. Not being without law to God. He knew he had to be good. But under law to Christ that I might gain them that are without law. What he means is they didn't have the law of Moses. So he says, I acted like a Gentile then. To the weak, I became as weak. We identified before the weak as people who had weak conscience, right? And to, around them, he was careful. He was more tender in the way he's operating. That I might gain the weak. I, made, uh, I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race, they all run. But one receives the prize so run that you may obtain. The prize, of course, here is your salvation, isn't it? And the salvation of your neighbor and your family. Every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Uh, that word, folks, temperate, temperate, what does that mean? Uh, it's related to patience, but there's a better phrase. Very good, yes, we're under self-control in what we do. Uh, we don't use that word too much in English anymore, but it's found very often in the King James. Uh, in a more modern translation, it'll almost always say self-control there as a hyphenated word, self-control. Now they that do it obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Anybody here ever uh, uh, get into any of the Olympic sports? Y'all don't see any of those? Some it, into any sport, yeah, pick one. In other words, you, you like one of them. I mean, there's no time to watch them all, so you, you pick one. All right, mine is curling. Y'all ever seen them do that? Yeah, some of y'all know what it is. I can't get enough of the curling. Here's what it is. They got these stones, and they throw them down this long sheet of ice, and it smashes into these other stones down in this circle, and the one ends up closest to the circle. In the end, you get points for those stones in that circle. Look, it, it's a big game of kind of combination tiddlywinks and, and marbles and all that wrapped up into one on ice. And, and you just, I can't get enough of it. It's called curling. It's been an Olympic sport for a long time. Well, anyway, uh, I don't care if you choose one of the weirdest, most out-of-the-way sports like that. Those people have to train their whole adult life, don't they? Or they're not even going to be able to compete. They, they can't even touch the competition. Those people have to curl those stones. They kind of push them down that ice and make them twist and turn. They have to do that day after day after day and practice hard. And then in the end, who gets the gold medal? How many teams get it? One, that's right. One team gets the gold medal. Do y'all get the idea now? I so run as to obtain the prize. Now, if somebody can pour that kind of energy into obtaining a circular piece of gold and their 15 minutes of fame. How is it that somebody cannot listen to what God said when he said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved? My friends, there are no excuses on the day of judgment. There's no excuse. What God told you is not too hard. And when God says, oh, you want to win the prize? Be grateful to me and be good. And we can't even do that. 
And somebody says, well, I'm going to show up on the day of judgment and I'll have a loophole or I'll have an excuse. There are no excuses. That's not hard. You devoted your whole life over here to being the best arm wrestler in the world. I'm just naming another, you know, I don't think that's Olympic sport, but anyway, whatever it is. Yeah, and, and you can't turn around and spend a little while to figure out how to be better than you were yesterday. You can't spend a little time to say thank you to God. You see what I mean? God is not too demanding. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. They which run the race, all of them run, but one receives the prize. You need to so run that you may obtain. Um, no excuse. Everybody needs to put forth the effort that is necessary, and in Christianity you can. Every man that strives for the mastery is temperate. You, you control yourself and you get it done. All right, so Paul says, if I want to be an effective Christian, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. I fight, not as one that beats the air. All right, that's another sport, which uh, a little bloodthirsty for some, but the boxing, right, which is much more tame in Olympics than it is in the professional bout. But in Olympics, at least they put on the headgear and all that, and they don't want them to get concussions and all that. But anyway, you, you're boxing. Well, a guy's not going to be very effective if he's over in his own corner and boxing in the air off the side of the corner. That's not going to work, is it? The, the other guy's over there. You're not going to make any points that way. He's over there. Uh, I fight not as one that beats the air, but I keep under my body, that is, under control. I bring it into subjection, lest by any means, when I preach to others, I should be myself a castaway. All right, let's answer a few questions here then from 1 Corinthians 9. First Corinthians 9. Paul continues to discuss Christian liberty. However, in this chapter, he looks at the subject as it relates to his apostleship. In this way, Paul not only can make some points about why living and matters of option, but he also can assert his authority to them as an apostle of God. It seems that some of them had called Paul's credentials into question. They shouldn't have, but they did. I got five minutes, though, right? That come on quick. Yeah, but I didn't think, I just checked the time too, but I wasn't looking at it right. Okay, can a preacher receive money for what he does? Yes, you put yes for that one, that's 1A. One Paul is justifying himself in the way that he is ministering to them. Is the preacher the only one who can receive money for what he does? No, let's go to a little other scripture. Uh, let's go to Philippians 4, somebody read verses 16 and 17. Philippians 4, 16 and 17. Very good. It was a spiritual benefit for them to send Paul the carnal things, as he would say, or the physical things, in order for him to be furthered in the gospel. The Philippian church was a great sponsoring congregation, ladies and gentlemen. People look at that and they say, well, give me an example of a sponsoring church. The Philippian church, and they were a good one at it too. And they helped him. But are the apostles the only ones that could receive the money? No, not, that's, see, he's arguing right here that it's a generic thing. It's not just apostles, but they were definitely helping him. Now, if you go over to another passage, let's look at it. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 17. Somebody read that one for us. 1 Timothy 5, 17. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, if you look in the context here, somebody says, oh, that means uh, give them a pat on the back. No, not necessarily. It can include that. But look at your context, folks. Look at the context. He is not referring to somebody only receiving money just for preaching ministry. There is this false concept in the modern world, and here's the reason why I'm harping on this, okay? The false concept is you've got a pastor system. And that preacher is in control of things. That's how the world looks at it. I know the church has a different perspective. That's how the world looks at it. And on top of that, they also want to funnel all the money through them. And the world doesn't seem to have a problem with that image. But it destroys a whole lot of what Christianity is supposed to be about. Here's what perplexes me. 
and I do not understand it. Those guys that want all the money funnel, funneled into the preacher instead of all ministries being supported, either monetarily or otherwise, they can or cannot be. That's the church's decision on what it monetarily supports for a ministry. But the fact of the matter is, is that these big mega churches that draw a lot of people, they'll have 10,000 or more there every Sunday. Those people are sitting in the pews and they're giving, I don't know, like to your Olstein churches, like Joel Olstein's church and stuff like that, maybe a million dollars a week. And what are they getting out of that? This guy preaching to them will have a big fancy mansion. He's got his own private jet. He goes out on his little uh, yacht and his excursion trips to wherever. He's selling them his own personalized uh, autographed Bibles and things like that and such. He's rolling in it. And why they think that's appealing among the preacher, I don't get it. Do you all? I don't get it. That would be an immediate detraction for me. And I think there's a little bit of this in the Corinthian brethren. Well, Paul didn't take any money from us. Is he really an apostle? Am I really an apostle? You wouldn't be Christians if it wasn't for me, Paul says. Who cares about whether I'm taking any money from you? You see what I'm getting at here? They're not, they're, their priorities are not in order. They're looking at it wrong. He's trying to be spiritual, and they're trying to say, well, boy, if he'd come and kind of took charge and everything, then we would have really respected his apostleship. And Paul's like, that's not what it's about. The greatest among you will be a servant. And he says, yeah, there's a right to be paid. That's fine. But I didn't take it from you for certain reasons. Like I said, I'm not sure of all his reasons, but I know it was good reasons. And this, this modern world concept that they want to funnel everything through these big fancy preachers and stuff, and the people like it to be that way, I think they look at them and they have this kind of... Uh, well, I'm not sure how they're looking at it. I'll be honest with you. Um, they idolize them, I guess. That's, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And I don't like it. As you can tell, I just don't like it. Somebody says, well, you're envious of those preachers. No, not really. I don't care what man's got anything. But what gets me to fuming is, is when I listen to them, and I'm not much of a preacher, but they don't preach anything. They don't say anything. They get up there and smile and talk and fume sometimes, and when it's all said and done, you're like, what did he say? I don't know any more Bible than I knew before. I don't know how to live better than I knew before. I've got this warm, fuzzy feeling. Here you go, preacher, have another hundred. I don't get it. I don't get it. Never fall in for that kind of reasoning, folks. It's destroying the world and the religious view of the Protestant preaching world. Yeah. It is. It's like a cult. Just like it. Just like it. You know, the, the nature of a cult to have everything funneled through one person, which also goes against the eldership idea, doesn't it? You know, because you have several, not just one man. But anyway, the cult idea to funnel everything that way joined with the concept that whatever he says must be true. Continuing revelation, the Lord laid it on my heart. That's a deadly combination. It is characteristic of every cult-like group that has ever existed. Everything funneled through one person, not Jesus, but through somebody on earth. And the second thing, continuing revelation. I'm telling you what God wants because God laid it on me. Those are the two characteristics of every cult-like group. All right, anyway, we're going to stop right there and we'll finish this up and go into chapter 10 next time.
attendance tonight, the invitation song will be number 420. Number 420. Knowledge is very important. In Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, God says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being priest for me. This right here is the knowledge that God has left for us. Who agrees that the Bible is perfect and complete? Who believes that this Bible contains all directions we need in order to be saved? Who believes this Bible contains all things pertaining to life and godliness? Who believes the Bible is the authority on all religious matters? The Bible has 66 books, and it is believed to have been written over a time span of 13 to 1,500 years. This book, when taught correctly, has not one contradiction. Does that seem like a divine power is involved? Yes. The scriptures refer to the Bible as the perfect law of liberty by James in chapter 1, verse 5. Second Peter 1, verse 3 says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, Jude chapter 1 verse 3 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should contend earnestly for the faith which was, past tense, once delivered unto you. The Bible is the complete holy word of God. It is the authority in all religious conversation and everyday life. An individual once used the B-I-B-L-E acronym and read basic instruction before leaving earth. I think this is fitting. We all need to get educated on this holy word. We will be judged according to it and one day we will die and stand in front of judgment. A good man once said people rely on the Bible to prove they are sinners and rely on their feelings to prove they are saved. How true is this statement for some? Why would anyone trust in the word of God to tell them they aren't living right and disregard it concerning salvation? We better get this right. He has spoke and written, Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6. He has spoke and written, Matthew 21, Matthew 7, verse 21 through 23. It reads, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. See, so many think you don't have to do anything. You better be doing the will of the Father in heaven. Then he says, many will say unto me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we not cast out devils? And in thy name done many works? This sounds like religious people to me. Do you think they had everything right? And then he will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Our Lord, our Lord has said in Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack in concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. First Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who, des who desires all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. He wants us all to be saved. When I read my Bible from Genesis to Malachi, my mindset is Jesus is coming. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus came. And Acts through Revelation, Jesus will come again. Since the beginning when God created all things, he created man and woman. And when they were led astray by the serpent, God saw a need for a Savior to come. This Savior would bring a redemptive plan for salvation for all men. He came to this earth and lived a perfect life. He left us with all his teachings and examples to apply to our lives. He suffered being beaten, spat upon, humiliated, and died among criminals and sinners on that cruel cross. He did that so we may have hope of eternal life through him. He did all this as a blameless, innocent man because the politicians of the time found no fault in him. Jesus loves us. He doesn't want us to perish. We have a choice. 
do not let him die in vain. There are what I consider two main promises in this book, and that's eternal life for the obedient believer and eternal torment for the disobedient non-believer, and we must obey. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 9 says he is the author of eternal salvation for those who obey. We are saved by grace through faith, according to Ephesians 2, 8. And hearing the gospel produces that faith. We must believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and confess it like the unit in Acts chapter 8. We must repent and be baptized for the remission of sins in order to become Christians, and we must remain faithful until death. That's Romans 10, 9 through 17, Mark 16, 16, and Acts 2, 38. Revelation 2.10. If you're here today, whether through live stream or in person, please do not delay. Tomorrow is not promised. Start your Christian walk today. If you're here and need prayers for forgiveness or strength, please come forward and make things right with God. As together we stand and sing. very much that message for the Newberry. Hope that we all can appreciate the value of being able to follow God's Word. And if there's someone here with us this evening and you have not yet followed after God's will to become a Christian, then we are always ready to assist you. Just uh, please do not delay too long. We have the privilege of having different things going on and also the ability to pray for some people that we need to mention of at this time. Uh, please, we want to talk to you about a few things. The days are shorter now. As you arrive at church, even as we get here, especially on a Wednesday, it is dark 30 already. And that means that we need to pay extra special attention to all these little ones over here that get out and about and they're trying to get out to the vehicle and they get to interacting with and playing with one another. It is very much a concern to some of us and they may not be thinking about it, but I'm sure all of us as parents and just adults do that uh, any of them could dart out right in front of you at any time, okay? And we don't have a particular posted speed limit because it's just that, a parking lot. And that means that the main object is simply to park safely and to get out of the parking lot safely, isn't it? So we want to remind everyone of the short days and the darkness out there and make sure that you're looking out as we uh, leave out in these evenings. Uh, another thing we want to do is to be in prayer that everything goes ready with the ladies who are going on the ladies' retreat. They leave out tomorrow. We want to pray that they have safety and journey and that all the things that they do will be edifying. The Nashville School of Preaching and Biblical Studies spring term begins Monday, January the 4th. If you're interested, you can please see Brother Wilder, and he has a sheet that will detail each particular class they're offering. They're doing those over Zoom, if you're familiar with the technology of it. I think uh, Hatton and I are looking into a couple of things there that we're going to be uh, working on uh, with a couple of classes there. But anyway, that starts in J January the 4th, so you got some time to think about it, but I'm sure they want you to register beforehand with the teacher. 
Um, we also want to be thinking about different people in our prayers. Our closing prayer will be led tonight by Brother Jonathan Smith at the appropriate time. Uh, Luke Jones will be uh, hopefully, prayerfully, coming home by Thanksgiving. That's what we're shooting for. It's what we want. Okay? So please be in prayer. He gets to come home uh, by Thanksgiving. That would be good. Uh, Angela Doss is recovering from uh, her recent sickness. Uh, Christy Dennis uh, has the virus. That's uh, Jackie and uh, Jennifer's uh, daughter. And, of course, that, uh, that family as well. You know, we just want all of them to be feeling and doing good. Uh, Harold and Sherry Brockett are very sick with the virus. Jonathan Royal family, of course, I'm not sure just any time they should be uh, over their quarantine, I think. It should be soon. Uh, the Travis uh, Lawson, he continues his treatments, and we, we know how grave, you know, his condition is there, so we want to hope and pray they continue to do well. Please have sympathy for the following families. The family of Luann Dykus, that's uh, Francis Hudson's sister-in-law, and uh, memorial services will be Saturday at 1 o'clock. The visitation will start at 11 o'clock here at Red Bowling. Sympathy goes to the family of Mike Bowman. Uh, that is uh, E.C. Meadows' son-in-law. There was an uh, accident with wood there. Uh, we don't have any arrangements on that one yet. Sympathy goes to the family of uh, Joyce Spivey. That's uh, Jennifer Halliburton's sister, Okay. And visitation starts tomorrow from 4 to 8, and the funeral is at 1 o'clock at Anderson in Lafayette. Randall and Penny Gold, some neighbors uh, of ours, they live right down from the Yorks, uh, they have the virus. And Randall got the plasma treatment today, so we certainly hope that that does very well for him and he's able to get better soon as he's been hospitalized from that. Uh, Judy Grissom is uh, sick at home, uh, but Amy is back with us tonight, so hopefully we can get Judy back here with us soon as well. Uh, Brittany Langford is uh, sick at home with the virus. Uh, Paul Massey uh, has a heart procedure soon. My understanding is they're going to do a heart cath, and they may very well likely do a stent or something you know, to that effect when they go in there and check all that out. I do want to remind everybody as we finish out on the announcements here, the very real and true expression that uh, uh, all gave some and some gave all and that uh, your ability and the privilege you have of worshiping God as opposed to many other places in the earth is because some others held that as their ideal and we're not going to allow anybody to trample on that or have anything to come in the way of that and I'm certainly very thankful of that myself and I'm sure others can give me an amen on that. All right, we appreciate very much you being here with us tonight and uh, we're going to turn the things back over I guess Do we have one more and then our closing song sing the first stanza of number 568 five six eight take the name of Jesus with you child of sorrow and of woe it will joy and comfort give you take it then where'er you go precious name oh how sweet hope of earth and joy of heaven precious name oh how sweet Our holy and awesome God and Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you thanking you so very much for the opportunity we have to come together tonight to study and learn from thy word. Lord, we thank you for all the many blessings of life you provide each and every one of us. Lord, for this nation in which we have freedom to come before you in worship and praise, Lord, without fear of persecution. Lord, we pray for this nation and 
the months and years to come, Lord, that you may cause its leaders, whoever they may be, to see the need to turn things back unto thee. And Lord, whatever we may face as Christians, Lord, that we would speak and act in a Christian manner and show thy example to those around us. Lord, we on this day especially remember those who protect this nation, those who do so now, Lord, and locally and in foreign lands, and Lord, those who have done so in the past and given so much of themselves for our benefit, Lord. We thank you for that and pray that you would bless each and every one of them and their families. Lord, we pray for this church, Lord, that it continue to stand as a beacon to our community and this world, Lord. Pray for its leaders that you would continue to give them wisdom to guide it and guide each of us in thy ways. Lord, we pray for our many sick, those who have been mentioned tonight are many, Lord, that you may be with them, be with those who tend to them, Lord, that their health may be restored and that they could be with us once again. Continue with us as we prepare to depart from this place. Lord, that as we go forth from here, that we would remember that we stand as thy example to those we come in contact with and help that we may seek to lead them unto thee. Forgive us when we sin, Lord. Thank you most of all for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his holy name we ask this prayer. Amen.